What does a Catholic bishop have to say about the issues in the world today? And what does he have to say to us as men? Stay tuned as we're joined by Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, right after this. Hey everyone, we are so thankful that you are here with us for another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. I want to start by thanking today's sponsor, which is Exodus 90, a great program for men. We're going to go into that later on in this episode, but for now, just a thank you to our sponsor. Um, we are your hosts, uh, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. We're grateful that you're here. If you have uh, listened to a few of these episodes and you like us, I want to ask a favor. If you'd like, give us a four star, five star on Spotify or um, Apple Podcasts, all of these things can really help expand the ministry. Finally, if you really enjoy what we're doing, you like our memes, our blogs, etc. If black and white is your color of choice, uh, consider donating to us on patreon.com slash Kathy gentlemen. We got a lot of great tears uh, there. So again, thank you for joining us. And as Sam mentioned at the beginning, we are joined today by His Excellency Bishop Joseph Strickland. He is the current bishop of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, since 2012, when he was elevated under Pope Benedict XVI. He was born the sixth child of Raymond and Monica Strickland in Fredericksburg, Texas, which is a great city that I've been to a few times. The family moved to Texarkana, Texas, and then to Atlanta, Texas. There in Atlanta, Texas, his family was the founding members of St. Catherine of Siena Church, as well as um, going through the public school system and graduating before entering into the Holy Trinity Seminary there at University of Dallas. He was ordained to the priesthood at the Diocese of Dallas of Saint, at St. Saint Monica Catholic Church in Dallas in 1985. He completed his canonical studies with uh, licentiate in canon law, and today, he is joining us. So, Bishop Strickland, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, John? And Good. Sam? Good. Doing very well. I loved reading your biography. I have been blessed. I'm here in Dallas-Fort Worth right now. Actually, this is where I am located. And so I have played trumpet professionally at St. Monica's Church more times than I can count. Yeah. And I've been, I've played in two weddings in the Diocese of Tyler um, back in my days of playing trumpet all the time. And uh, so it's, uh, it's good to connect to uh, with another Texan. Great. Sounds good. So if I could, I'd like to start and talk a little bit about your, your life and youth, right? Because um, we've got, I was born and raised Catholic. Sam is a convert. Sounds to me that your father was a Southern Baptist convert. Your mother was an Australian. And so what, what was life like uh, living in Texas with that? Were you alive when your dad converted or how did that all, oh, yeah. all work out? Uh, yeah, well, I think I was... It was probably around the time I was born. Um, I, as it said, I was number six of seven kids. Mm. And uh, my parents had been married about 10 years. So roughly around the time I was born. So all the time as growing up, my father was Catholic and he went to mass with us. But that didn't happen for several years after he married this Irish Catholic woman from Sydney, Australia. My father grew up in what is now the Diocese of Tyler, small okay. town called Clarksville. So um, very much a, a family of uh, one cradle Catholic, one convert. But the way I was raised, being Catholic was the best thing ever. Um, mm. And that was really the attitude. In a small town where there weren't many Catholics, being Catholic was just, you know, like we were superstars because we were Catholic. <clears throat> have fun that's wonderful yeah so did, did the did the uh parish have a a big presence in your town i mean were you uh kind well, of uh, well it, it's well a small town and a small we were a mission the whole time i was growing up it is a parish now but still a small parish but it, it certainly had a the church had a big place in our family um and actually 
when our family moved there shortly after the Glen Mary priest came and we began to have St. Catherine's mission. Mm -hmm. uh, so it all started shortly after we got there. Um, there was uh, a book that I participated in that actually had chapters of fathers and sons. And I told the story of my father as a Catholic convert when we moved from Fredericksburg, a very Catholic, German Catholic town, yeah. which my mother loved because it was very Catholic. And he said, we're moving to Texarkana and then Atlanta. Um, and specifically when, when because Texarkana had, had a church, uh, Sacred Heart also on the Texas side. When we moved, when she heard we were moving to Atlanta, of course, I've just heard this story. I don't remember her saying this, but she said, is there a church, uh, was her first question. And my father's answer was, there will be. And he got busy and contacted the few Catholics that were there. They contacted the Bishop of Dallas and managed to get Glen Mary Priest to come and start this mission my earliest memory of going to mass there in Atlanta was in the city hall of the Catholic church of the, the town, which is right across the street from where the church was ultimately built. And I remember my, my specific memory of going to mass in that city hall was kneeling next to my father in the, in the aisle, because it was, you know, it was like those old timey theater seats that, you know, the, the seat goes down. Um, and so there wasn't any place to kneel really in the body of the seat. So everybody moved to the aisle and it was carpeted. So it made it a little more comfortable. But I remember kneeling there next to my father in the aisle of the city hall as we went to mass. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. I, uh, I love that uh, pioneering spirit. Well, there, there will be a church here and I'm going to make it happen. So uh, I'm just curious about your vocational, but if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that, did you know very early on that you were going to be a priest uh, or in, and someday a bishop like, or like my son who says he's going to be the Pope someday? Um, <laughs> well, I, I wasn't um, a kid. You, you know, you hear about kids playing mass. I didn't do that. Maybe one of the reasons is because I started serving mass very early, um, probably around second grade, I guess, right after my first communion, because there weren't many boys around. And I was glad to serve. And I served from then all the way. I, I guess I've been serving ever since in one way or another. Um, but as I mentioned, being Catholic was the best thing ever, as far as we were taught. And um, in a very joyful way, we grew up Catholic. We St. Catherine's had a nine o'clock mass um, and still does. And there was never any question. I mean, we went to mass on Sunday. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any debate about which mass we were going to because there was only one. There was the nine o'clock mass. Now there's a Spanish mass later because the Spanish population has grown. But growing up, I think there was one a Mexican American family that didn't even speak Spanish that we grew up with as the the community developed, and so going to mass was just what we did, and we were, you know, we were sort of a family of church mice. My mother played the organ. My father was an usher. Mm -hmm. All of us kid, I served. A lot of us were lectors. Um, you know, so we were very involved. We would help decorate the church for Christmas and Easter, mow the yard. I painted the church one. So we, we very, a lot of our social life, we, we weren't a wealthy family. We lived out in the country on about 100 acres. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our social life revolved around the church. And I think that just sort of made it. Um, I had an older brother that actually went to the seminary, didn't continue, and was never ordained. But um, so he was 12 years older than me. He started college. He started seminary the day I started first grade. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of planted the seed for me. My my oldest brother was always like a movie star to me being 12 mm -hmm. years older. I was just in awe. He played football and, you know, had girlfriends in high school. And it just, you know, I always thought of them kind of as movie stars, you know, as a little kid in a small town. <laughs> so I know that kind of planted the seed for me that, Going to the seminary was a possibility, and really about the time I became a freshman in high school, 
you know, they start talking to you about what's your career plan and what are you going to do in your life. And, and I know that I didn't really tell anybody immediately, but I, I thought, well, I, I might want to be a priest. And then as I, I graduated from high school, and I remember telling my parents and my family that it was like there was a monkey on my back, and I just wanted to check it out. I, I didn't really, and, it, and looking back, even though I was very committed Catholic in the family where it was just the best thing ever, um, I, I really had no idea what I was getting into and, and had to really learn the faith. Went to the University of Dallas, which is a, a good, strong Catholic uh, university that the, the seminary, Holy Trinity and Irving, where the, where the university is, Holy Trinity Seminary is just down the hill from the University of Dallas. So that's where I took, started there. My very first class, freshman year, the very first class I went to was Spanish, which they told me when I started, you're going to learn Spanish, which I'm glad they did because um, our diocese is at least 50% Hispanic now. So it's very handy to speak Spanish. Yes. Yeah, I'd say. And so then, um, Obviously, you you pursued a licentiate in canon law, and you continued, um, and then you uh, were were chosen as as a bishop in in 2012. So you've been a bishop for 10 years. How has life been uh, as a bishop? Well, I'd have to say it's been a very interesting nine, almost 10 years. 10 years in November. Um, very interesting. It, there are a lot of interesting elements because. I was rector of the cathedral, which is mm -hmm. now I'm bishop of the same cathedral. I was rector of the cathedral here in Tyler for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So people, I became a monsignor in 96, um, but people still called me Father Joe. I actually answered the phone when the nuncio called, which was um, Archbishop Vigano was the oh. nuncio in 2012 when he called and I answered the phone in this same building. I was the administrator of the diocese. I was at the other end of the building in an office, and I answered the phone, Father Joe, um, because that's, you know, just how people have known me. People still will call me Father Joe and then apologize, and I say, you don't need to apologize. So um, I've, what one of the unusual aspects, certainly bishops, it's not really the norm, but it's not that unusual for a bishop to be named a bishop of the diocese where he was a priest. A lot of times what tends to happen is they may be sent off somewhere and then they come back as mm -hmm. a bishop of that diocese. But I was a priest here and like I said, for 16 years, rector of the cathedral. So as I've told people, I worked at that cathedral as the assistant priest when it first became a diocese, uh, as the rector and now as the bishop. It's So I don't move a lot. Things change, but I don't move a lot. Um, certainly, the church has been through some interesting times, and especially the past five years or so. Um, the world has been through some interesting times. So it, it's been de definitely a, an interesting time to be a bishop and uh, a lot of blessings, but a lot of challenges. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was uh, just reflecting on the uh, significance of the last 10 years. It sounds like it's been very interesting for you. Um, but I was confirmed on Easter in 2012, so that was almost exactly 10 years ago. And then uh, Catholic Gentleman was was founded almost 10 years ago, and two, it, was two, it was 2013, so almost 10 years ago. But okay. uh, it's 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 uh, it's definitely been a a lot of upheavals in the last 10 years, and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess I'm wondering too, you know, as a bishop, and you've you've um, you know, Pope Francis has talked a lot about, um, you know, needing to be close to your people and things like that. And I'm just wondering, like, as a bishop who has a lot of administrative duties, you know, you're, you're speaking to the media and you're, you're managing things very, um, uh, in a very, um, again, administrative way. Um, how much opportunity do you have to be close to your people? And what, what are some of the joys of that? for you as you um, get to be kind of the pastor of your diocese? 
Well, it is, um, again, another unusual element of being in a rural diocese. Tyler is a little over 100,000. It's the largest city in the diocese. Everything else is, it goes down from there to very small towns, a lot of rural communities. And uh, so we have a small chancery and it does make it much easier to be accessible to the people. Um, I was actually there at what they call Bishop School in Rome the, in 2013, ordained a bishop in, in November of 2012. In September, I went to Bishop School a week of just basically visiting the dicasteries and kind of getting uh, an understanding of how it all works. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. But uh, I was there when Pope Francis said, smell like the sheep. I was actually there in the, the congregation because he was speaking to, a, I forgot what, what mass we went to. But anyway, I was there and uh, and it, it is easy. Uh, we'd have to translate that a bit. We have more cattle than sheep in East Texas, but um, <laughs> I think I, I managed to smell like the cows. We, I grew up with cows. And, a lot uh, of horns, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but it is, I think I do appreciate, you know, I'm a pastor at heart. I was a pastor for m- many years, uh, more than 25 years of priesthood before I became a bishop. And so the pastoral work, being in touch with the people it, is always a blessing. And and as I tell people that, you know, we talk about the church and issues and the hierarchy, the hierarchy of the church certainly has a tremendous responsibility. I like to constantly remind myself of the promise to guard the deposit of faith that I take very seriously. But the hierarchy of the church is a very small percentage of the billion plus Catholics in the world. And I think we need to to remember that, to keep that in perspective. One of the things that we um, try to emphasize in the diocese with the St. Philip Institute and other efforts that are here to teach the truth of the faith is from the one of the best calls that we have from the Second Vatican Council is a universal call to holiness. That's not anything new, but an emphasis from a church council that everyone, all the baptized are called to holiness. I think it fits hand in hand with the idea of the bishop smelling like his sheep and recognizing that it's the flock that really is the church and that is called to live Jesus Christ, to be his church, to be his mystical body in very significant, deep ways. We've got tremendous work to do to really help people understand, but really, Sam, I say we have a lot of converts in our diocese because it is less than 10% Catholic. So people either moved here and they're Catholic or they converted to the Catholic faith like my father did. So converts very often in this time, uh, John, are you a cradle Catholic? I am cradle. Yeah, cradle Catholic. Um, But you converts, Sam, tend to be very strong and we Mm -hmm. need you. Because we cradle Catholics, I you know, I, since I am a cradle Catholic, I can yeah. sort of say things, I guess, or I do. But too many of us cradle Catholics are asleep in the cradle and not mm-hmm. recognizing the treasure that we have in our Catholic faith. So thank you, Sam, for that commitment that um, you're a young man now. So you must have been fairly young when you became a Catholic, but you were still, you made that choice yourself. And I think that brings great energy to the church. Every baptized Catholic should embrace that call, um, and many do. Uh, but we we're really strengthened by those of you who intentionally chose to study and then ultimately become Catholic, because you get what too many Catholics don't get. And, and certainly, it doesn't happen magically with converts either. We've actually done studies, and and I've seen studies of those who come into the church through RCIA at Easter, but how many of them ultimately fall away from Mm. actively practicing their faith. So certainly it's the grace of God that we're responding to and uh, that we're called to respond to, but we really need to be you know, full of vigor and joy and, and sharing the truth that is Jesus Christ. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. and 
Uh, I don't, I don't, I could say so many things about that conversion process and subsequently my life as a Catholic, but I won't, I don't want to distract from what we're here for, but I just, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I agree very much. There's so many great things that you stated and um, we've been through so much in the last uh, two, three years, actually, as, um, as you are fully aware of. And I, I mean, I know that when I was blessed to uh, meet you in person the first time, it was at uh, Sister Josephine's final vows, and I was uh, so grateful to to have that. And and I generally, I'll pretty much always go to a traditional church, either Latin Mass or an ordinary parish, where receiving on the tongue was just with they made it they made it happen throughout all of um, of the. Um, the pandemic. And so uh, being able to just kind of walk up to you and say, can I receive on the tongue? And you have no problems with that was, was a huge blessing for me because uh, you know, I'm always a little anxious and, and, and settings outside of, you know, on the knees and uh, um, et cetera. So I, I appreciate that very much. And you, you say so many good things. And I, I, I was able to experience that, like you were saying, you know, dropping the seeds. And I think uh, of your own discernment and I think, um, you know, seeing your older brother and how wonderful that is. And, and fathers need to realize that uh, in the lives of their children, because my um, seven-year-old now, female uh, little girl, she has told me so many times that she wants to become a nun. And it was because at the ordinary at parish, the cathedral in Houston, where we used to go, um, the um, the sisters of um, Dominican sisters of um, the Most Holy Eucharist uh, attend there, and and so they would see them all the time, and they'd always point it out and became a very real lived experience. And so I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think that, um, that I was the first vocation director for the diocese. And really, I think for many, the the seeds of vocation are sown as, as life is. I mean, young children say, especially in the years one to seven, that's when the, the person is really formed in so many ways. And that's why it's so tragic when there's harm done to young children in whatever way, um, because it leaves sometimes scars that that person can't overcome for life. Mm. And the opposite is true. It gives blessings and strengths that carry you through all sorts of things that you face as you become a teenager and then an adult. So I, I really think that, and I love the the title of your um, podcast. Is it yeah. or um, the Catholic gentleman? Because we need to be that. Men need to be Catholic gentlemen. And as a as, as a kid who grew up here, East Texas is sort of the edge of the South. There's a lot of we actually have areas that were plantations mm. in, in the early years of. I mean, in the during the Civil War and the cotton was grown in this area. So we're right on the edge of the South. And a lot of that um, atmosphere, I mean, people still will will say yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. Uh, people say God bless you because it's a very evangelical Protestant area, which as a Catholic bishop, I very feel very comfortable in, at least on the moral issues, because the catechism's teaching and the teaching of evangelical Protestants on the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, God created us male and female, on the, all the moral sexual issues, we're all right in line. So the, uh, the idea of being a Catholic gentleman, we really need to emphasize that and to own that and teach boys to become men. I've, uh, I've been in several conversations about the, the issue that we need real men in the world today and not to to shy away from that to say oh it's not politically correct to be a man there's nothing more correct than to be the man that god created you to be and and that's not some sort of you know coarse uh image that sometimes gets portrayed a man a real catholic man is a gentleman is a man who opens the door for the ladies. And and I, you can get away with that here in East Texas. Yeah. I know some places, you know, the woman will say, tell you rather um, forcefully, don't open the door for me. But in that, you know, it gets so distorted and mistranslated. But 
whatever um, the attitudes, a real Catholic gentleman is what we need to be um, and to rejoice in our Catholic faith and to, to be men. Jesus Christ was a gentleman. We know mm. that because he was a sinless man. And anything short of being a gentleman is, is where, you know, the sinfulness creeps in. And a gentleman puts others first, certainly ladies first, but anyone else. I mean, we we need to have that kind of ethic in life. And, and the world desperately needs it. Um, so I commend you for the title of your podcast and and for really helping men to acknowledge that, frankly, guys, we have too many wimpy models mm-hmm. men that aren't so sure that they are men. Mm-hmm. We don't need that. We need and 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 to be loving and kind and caring. And thankfully, I saw that with men in my life, with my father. And I only had one grandfather that I knew. The other had died long before I was born. But one grandfather that was very much a man, but gentle and um, and strong. A gentle strength is what a gentleman brings, and and that's what we need to to cultivate in the boys, because you know um, things happen physically for a boy to become a man. But as as has been pointed out in conversations that I've had, there. A, a woman goes through a real beautiful transformation from girl to woman. Mm-hmm. A man um, actually gets a little coarser and, you know, and maybe a little, a little less attractive sometimes, but mm. in, at least in worldly terms, but um, a man needs, a boy needs to sort of intentionally um, embrace the call to, to manhood. A woman can often be thrust into being a, a girl thrust into being a woman because she becomes of the age of being childbearing. One of the issues, I mean, I know we could talk about many issues for many hours, but one of the key issues is for men to conceive a child with a woman and then disappear, whether there was a marriage or there wasn't, or for whatever reason, that isn't being a man and certainly not being a gentleman to just sort of disappear from the scene once a child has been conceived. And that's one of the things that we've got to teach boys. That's not what a man does. Certainly. I mean, we, I believe more than ever in the, the moral teachings of the church as critical for humanity. They're not just, well, this Catholic idea, it's critical to humanity that our, you know, sexual expression is only for one man and one woman married in a lifetime commitment and open to children. I mean, you have to bring all of that into and teach boys. You just don't have a sexual relationship unless you're married to the woman. I mean, imagine how that would alter the sexual landscape of our world if suddenly we were able to just flip a switch and every single sexual sexual encounter was between, I mean, just starting with between a man and a woman in marriage and then mm-hmm. open to children. I mean, the percentage of, of where that actually happens on the planet is, is devastatingly small. But yeah. that's God's plan. That should be happening. It sh- there shouldn't, it shouldn't be happening otherwise. And I'm sorry, I get, you know, sort of carried away with it's like, what's he talking about? No, this but, is great. But it's it's part of the fabric of being a man. And being a real man is knowing how to live as a Catholic gentleman. How do you live your life as a Catholic gentleman? And basically that's chastity for I presume maybe both of y'all are married. Of course, I'm yep. not, never will be, but I have to be a Catholic gentleman of chastity. As every Amen. married man, every single man, every man, chastity takes different forms for a married man, certainly. Um, but Catholic gentlemen need to be chaste, and you can't, you aren't a Catholic gentleman if you're not chaste. Hmm. Amen. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Exodus 90. 
you don't know who Exodus 90 is, we strongly encourage you to check them out. They are a ministry for men that provide a roadmap for spiritual um, and actually physical growth. Exodus 90 is all about asceticism, prayer, and brotherhood. Now, those three pillars really form the basis of the program, but it's 90 days of spiritual exercises, readings, uh, getting together with your brothers in your fraternity that you choose. Um, and it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. I've done it a few times. Uh, and it can be hard. It can be demanding. But we need a little bit uh, of asceticism in our lives today. The church doesn't ask very much of us these days. And that's okay. But sometimes we need a little bit of an extra spiritual shot in the arm. And that's what Exodus 90 can provide. So there's a science behind why Exodus 90 is developed the way it is, right? Those 90 days have a purpose. But another great thing about Exodus 90 is that they also offer different variations. They offer a Lenten program. They offer different challenges over the summer. So basically, they have something that's there to fit your needs. Again, asceticism, prayer, fraternity, and really that roadmap that men find so helpful. I know that I did when I went through it. So we strongly encourage you to check them out at exodus90.com slash Catholic Gentleman, or click on that link in the show notes. I uh, resonate with so much of what you're saying, uh, because our culture has kind of fallen so far from from that ideal of gentlemanliness. And we've, we've discussed before on this podcast, how, when, when people like attack toxic masculinity, you know, and if you really listen to what they're saying, they're not actually attacking masculinity per se. What they're attacking is failure of masculinity and failing to be men. And um, so we have a, we have a huge opportunity to step up and the further our, the culture falls from that ideal, the more like a true gentleman will stand out from the crowd in that environment. And people will say, why, why are you doing that? You know, what's different about you? I'll tell me more. I'm interested because you're not acting like everyone else. There must be some reason for that. Um, but I, I guess uh, my question is we see our culture is increasingly polarized. It's, Maybe I'm deluding myself, I don't know, but it seems like in the past there used to be more of a social consensus where, you know, maybe we disagree on some things, but by and large, we, we agree on this and we agree on this and, we, you know, you're, you're kind to your neighbors and, and you're, there's a, a generally accepted morality, whereas now things are just more and more polarized and there's no center anymore. And that's morally, that's religiously, that's politically, seemingly every area of society. And as a leader, um, you know, a religious leader that people are looking to. I know you've been very vocal on some of these issues. How do you strive to be a Catholic gentleman in kind of this cultural storm uh, that we're in where it just feels like uh, everything that was sure in the past is now being attacked and, you know, people are getting more and more vicious and hateful towards each other. And how do you stand firm uh, and what advice would you have for us as we kind of engage with the culture as well? Well, Sam, uh, that's a rather large challenge you've given me, but um, it mm -hmm. really is what it comes down to. And I would say a Catholic gentleman is humble. Humility, mm -hmm. real humility is probably one of the things that is the greatest way for us to really grow as Catholic gentlemen. What comes to mind to me is what we say in the Mass, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Mm -hmm. That yeah. needs to be our, our statement of purpose in many ways, because built into, Lord, I am not worthy. A real man knows that. A real man knows that we are sinners, I'm a sinner. I go to confession often because I need to, not because I'm saintly, but because I'm not, and I need to grow in sanctity. That's true for every man. The only man that ever lived, fully God and fully man, that had no sin was Jesus Christ, as the scriptures say, like us in all things but sin. And so to be a man is one who humbly acknowledges that we are sinners. 
And just like you, you said so well, Sam, the toxic masculinity is men sinning and not, um, not being a good model of what a Catholic gentleman is. So I think humility is huge. It, it, we have to embrace that. You know, we have to acknowledge we're not God. God is the creator of all. God is the one who's given us commandments. God is revealed through his son, ultimately, the God-man walking this earth. And I love to, as, as I pray the rosary, which I would emphasize, you know, I think even as a kid, um, you, you can get the impression, oh, well, the, the rosaries are ladies' things. And I think a lot of men kind of, oh, the rosary, that's that's a, a, a womanly prayer, and it's wonderful, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's not really for men. Hogwash. Mm -hmm. Real men pray the rosary, because what is the rosary? It's a reflection on the mysteries of the real man, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and his, his joys, his sorrows, his sufferings, and his glory, and his luminous presence. So, I love to think about um, the Lord in the rosary, and, you know, I love to think of Jesus at different ages, you know, whatever, I'm 63, so I'm 30 years beyond the age that Jesus lived, mm -hmm. but I, I like to tell kids, especially young people, boys and girls, but especially for, I mean, I think for a boy to really think about, you know, that Jesus was their age, maybe it's a 12-year-old. He was in the temple at 12 years old or 15 or 16 or 18 to, to think about Jesus really living this human journey. And we can all, always say, oh, well, he was the son of God. But the scriptures tell us, and there's a great mystery there. How does that work? How does the son of God learn to walk? How does the son of God, you know, learn, you know, how does the son of God get potty trained? I mean, but all of that happened. That's the wonder of the incarnation, a real human being that was really fully God also. And a lot of what's broken in the world is we've lost touch with the, the God man that is Jesus. Mm. And if we don't know him, it's hard for us to know ourselves. And we don't, we don't know God, we don't know ourselves. So uh, the challenge is tremendous, but we have the model in Jesus Christ that we can always turn to. We taught, we hear about, oh, well, this truth has changed, and we need to, we need to know that things aren't set in stone. Jesus Christ and the truth that he proclaimed is set in stone. He gave us the model. He revealed to us what we're called to do, and he told us, if you love me, you will live my commandments. We hear a lot about love, and I've grown up in the church and in the world hearing a lot about love. A lot of the pop songs growing up, you know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And absolutely, but it's been diluted to this, mm -hmm. as someone mentioned recently, sort of a cotton candy sugar sweet that if it doesn't taste good to you, it's, it's gone. And that's not really, that's not love at all. Love is much deeper and much more sacrificial and much more profound than what is spoken of or illustrated as love today. Jesus Christ is love incarnate. He's truth incarnate. We have to look to him. And uh, in the early church, knew him and looked to him. And that's what gave the church the strength. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit solidified that. I love a prayer of St. John Fisher that I just rediscovered recently. It's a prayer for bishops, and he prays and acknowledges that the apostles were just weak men, that Jesus, mm. he gathered 12 weak men. One of them immediately betrayed him, so he had 11 weak men, and then apostolic succession kicked in, and in the first uh, Matthias was the first to be chosen through basically apostolic succession. But those weak men were, as St. John Fisher says in his prayer, the, the sort of squishy mud that they were made of became stone 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And St. John Fisher's prayer is the bishops of his day, and we need to pray for me and all the bishops of our day to be that same Holy Spirit to create stone pillars of truth and joy and life in Jesus Christ. We just don't see enough of that. We really don't. And, you know, here I am, Bishop of where? Who is this guy? I'm a, it's a small diocese in Northeast Texas, a beautiful part of Texas. Um, but I'm as much a bishop as any other bishop in, in the large, in Mexico City, which is a huge uh, metropolitan area of what, what, 30 plus million people. Um, Tyler isn't even a neighborhood in Mexico City. But the Archbishop of Mexico City and the Bishop of Texas have the same job of mm. guiding the flock in the truth of Jesus Christ. I have the same responsibility and the same authority. And that's, you know, listen, guys, that gets scary to, to think of yourself as a successor of the apostles with the, the same responsibility that they had. And look what happened to them. All except John yes. died mm. doing their job. And John, in a sense, lived a white martyrdom into his old age, being in prison and sacrificing and living the truth, being strong enough. He didn't get killed, but he stood at the foot of the cross. Yeah. Those The apostles, I, I like to say with our institute, we need to be uh, first century Christians in the 21st century. We need that apostolic zeal. Amen. That's what, by the power of the Holy Spirit, these weak men were strengthened by God and always knew that they relied on the grace of God and his strength to move forward with the mission that the Son of God gave them. We need to return to those roots of strength. Yeah. Oh, amen. I really appreciate that. And I, I'm grateful for you saying that. And so I do want to ask a question of what, what would you say to men who, I mean, it should be no surprise to any of our listeners um, why we desired to have you on this show, right? We see you as, as a model bishop, as somebody that we can look up to, whether we are in uh, your diocese or not. We live in a digital age where uh, our podcast reaches, you know, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of countries, but we also get the reverse of that, where we get to hear kind of the negative things that are happening, very unorthodox things that are happening by bishops and leaders and things like that. So I, I, I want you to speak to men who maybe within their diocese, um, their bishop is doing something or outspoken in, in a way that's very heterodox or very, um, you know, I, 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 I'm always cautious about saying heretical or things like this, you know, because of all the necessary conditions. But that being said, um, what do you say to men who are looking for leaders and maybe they don't have a father within their own diocese that 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 is guiding them and they they find you and, you know, they, they might go to an influencer online that's not even a priest and stuff like that. I'd really love to hear your thoughts about the digital space and about men who are, are looking for for those leaders and those guidance and maybe maybe in the wrong places. And, uh, and, and how would you address that? Well, um, it is a, it is a challenging time, but we are blessed with the, the, the global communication that, and I've been contacted by people in Uganda. Um, <laughs> I honestly, my geography is not that good. I know it's in Africa, <laughs> but I, I really can't tell you what Uganda as a nation borders on, but mm -hmm. it, it just reminds us we are all the flock of the Lord, and I think that's what, as a bishop, and all bishops, all pastors, really, bishops and priests and deacons, we're all, we all have that ordained role to be, to pastor God's people. Um, the sheep need a shepherd, um, and so it, it has been interesting for me, I, you know, I, I speak out. I believe I'm supposed to, um, and I would love to, to have a chorus I would love to be drowned out by the bishops of the world just speaking so loudly that they forget and don't hear the voice of Bishop Strickland of Tyler any longer, because mm -hmm. they're hearing that everywhere. I think that part of what plagues us in this time is a hesitation regarding judging. As the scriptures say, judge not lest ye be judged. 
judging the other person. Thankfully, only God ultimately. We can pass judgments all over the place. But ultimately, for the judgment that matters, that's up to God. And that's what we all have to. I have to prepare for that judgment before the Lord that he guarantees us in the Gospels that that's, that's what will happen. The sheep and the goats will be separated. Judgment will come from Jesus Christ as appointed by the Father. Um, so each of us will be judged. And that, so on that path, no, we don't judge the other person. I don't judge you, John. I don't judge you, Sam. But we do need to make judgments about truth and about actions that are veering from the truth. Uh, an image that I am reminded of constantly is probably you're familiar with a plumb line that basically it's it's a lead weight that you can get to to really get centered on on a, a space to to know exactly where you are. And all of us need to carry that plumb line of Christ of the truth. Mm. He lived, suffered, died, and rose to give us the to reveal truth to humanity. And we're all too often we're ignoring that truth, even within the church. It is not my authority to change something that Christ shared with us. We can understand it more deeply, and we need to. We need to know Christ more deeply. But to start changing things, that's simply not what the church is about. And so the men of the world and the women, but men have to take their place. Women have to take theirs. But we're talking about Catholic gentlemen. Yeah, We have to know that we've got to make some judgments, not judging the person, not judging your local bishop or your local priest. But if they are not speaking according to what the catechism and the scriptures and the, the magisterial teachings of the church uh, uh, if they're speaking against the deposit of faith, you got to call them out and you got to say, no, I'm sorry, respectfully, respectfully to anyone. We mm -hmm. shouldn't be attacking and vicious and ugly to certainly not your bishop or your priest, but to your brother next to you in the pew. If they're saying something that you know isn't true, you have to respectfully and lovingly say, no, brother, that's not the case. That's another dimension of real love. Real love guides someone as we all seek the truth. You, we all love people in our lives. And real love is guiding someone to the truth. Mm -hmm. And is if they're not living the truth, I mean, for the, the parent who has a child, a teenager, that is old enough to sin and maybe, maybe making some sinful choices. Parents have the challenge of loving when the, it doesn't feel like love, maybe, because a lot of times love means saying no mm -hmm. or saying you must. It, it follows those commandments that Christ says, if you love me, you will live my commandments. We can't switch and change and alter the commandments according to our whim because then we're not loving Christ. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 it's like <laughs> sin denies reality at some level. It's like, the, the, the what is truth? It's like corresponding to reality, right? And it's like, if I my child was playing on the train tracks uh, and I, I said, I saw, I heard a train coming, and I didn't say anything, you know, it would be, it wouldn't be loving of me as a parent because the reality is they're going to get hurt if they continue on the, to play on the train track. So as a loving parent, I have to take into account reality and help that child live in accordance with that. Um, Absolutely. You know, and uh, so it's a, it's a challenge to navigate sometimes. And, and oftentimes the, the you know we speaking to uh, individuals one on one is so much more personal. You can hear their story. You can understand where they came from, and and uh, and yet we still have a responsibility when we we speak to the culture to hold fast to those those truths. And so we just want to thank you 
Bishop Strickland, for your witness. It is so encouraging to us as we need those strong beacons. And I love what you said earlier about uh, like loving, joyful, like rocks of truth. Like we, we, uh, it brings us as faithful so much joy when we see um, our spiritual leaders standing firm and holding fast to, uh, as St. Paul said, you know, the traditions that have been handed down either by word of mouth or by letter, like hold fast to those traditions. And so thank you for your witness uh, to us. Yes. Uh, uh, as we as as we are looking for those those rocks of steadfastness in these kind of uncertain times. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely, I'm grateful. And so we're going to put your uh, we're coming up close here to the end here. So we're going to put your your website. We're going to put your Twitter handle. You've got a much larger following than we do on Twitter. And <laughs> and, uh, and I know you're not particularly seeking or self seeking. But is there anything else you would like to tell um, men uh, before we wrap up this episode? Yes, I would encourage men to spend time with him, spend time with the Lord. He's really there in the tabernacle. If you can go to Eucharistic Adoration, he's really there. Talk to him, listen to him, read scripture with him, but be with him. Just like when we love someone, sometimes it's just being there, just sitting there. And he loves us and he wants us, every single one of us. He wants us to know him. So that's what I would say finally is make sure you get to know Jesus Christ and spend time in his Eucharistic presence. It's transformational in my life, and it will if we open our hearts to his presence. He's really there, and that's what we need to, to be strengthened in that truth. Amen. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so very much uh, for being here with us. You are absolutely in our prayers, and we are just so grateful for your witness, um, you know, for your example uh, to each of us. So thank you for your time. And thanks, John, and thanks, Sam. God bless you. God bless. And as we like to end every one of our episodes. And be a man, be a saint. Thank you.